Okay. Uh, actually, this is not going to be the first lecture. We're going to flip around the lectures a little bit, guys, um, to the AV team. Hello? We're going to switch the lectures a little bit. So I'll come back there and let you know which lectures are going. Um, you, you understand? Okay. So anyway, um, I want to welcome everybody to the afternoon session. I think it's a very important session here um, in, in the current uh, context of what's happening in the drug-coated balloon arena. Um, this is a, a, a session that's been put together with, with some thought and has been copied at, uh, from other sessions that, that have been held at many major meetings, uh, such as Link and uh, Charing Cross as well. And I'm sure will be copied in other meetings as well, because I think the more uh, knowledge and understanding we have of this, it's going to be very important to see how we can uh, treat our patients. So the, the panelists and, and our moderator um, are, are all really world, world experts in, in, in what they're doing. Um, they've either led uh, major clinical trials or have been involved uh, very closely uh, with, the, with the development of the, of the drug-coated balloon technology. And, and th this is an opportunity for, for all of you to talk and, uh, and ask questions very openly. Um, Dr. Garcia has been kind enough to, uh, to moderate this session, and we're going to do some flip-flopping of, of, the, of the lectures, because I know Dr. Granada and a few other people have to, have to be in and out, so I really appreciate them making time to, to come here. The, the, this will be followed up by a, a very special uh, industry uh, panel, which Dr. Scheinert will moderate, and, and I, think, I think that that would be good uh, for all of us to be able to ask questions to industry in, in, in which direction that we're going to be heading based on either this controversy or also what are the, what are the other opportunities that are going to be available in, as we tackle the difficult disease of PAD. So again, I thank Lawrence. Lawrence, thank you very much for leading the session. Really appreciate it. All right, so we're uh, going to get started with the, uh, the town hall, and if I could thank uh, PK and Dirk for the very kind invitation to the, uh, to the conference. Um, we're in a challenge time, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it's driven by um, uh, a, a very um, difficult question to answer when we don't really understand the question that's been asked to give you an answer as to what, what's going on. But currently there's a big interest in what the uh, data set suggests when it comes to paclitaxel exposure and immortality. And so today we're gonna have a series of around uh, eight talks um, as we move forward uh, trying to understand this before the, uh, the industry executives take over. Um, and I'm gonna introduce my good friend uh, from New York, uh, Juan Granada, who's gonna talk about the toxicological aspects and safety profile when it comes to paclitaxel. Juan. Thank you, Lawrence. And uh, it's actually great that, um, that this talk actually was first, because actually, typically, sometimes they put me like a third or fourth, and uh, it's difficult to talk about this topic after people have presented clinical data. So I'm going to provide an overview of um, the toxicological aspects and um, also translational uh, aspects of uh, drug-coated balloon uh, technologies. This is my uh, conflict uh, slide. Uh, most of you actually know uh, paclitaxel has very unique uh, pharmacological properties. It's a highly uh, hydrophobic uh, uh, drug. As a biphasic uh, decline uh, in plasma, one is actually given under an intravenous uh, uh, form. And approximately uh, 90 to 98% is bound to uh, plasma proteins. It's got an extensive extravascular uh, distribution and tissue binding. It's actually very special because it really uh, binds to uh, a lot of uh, proteins. And 12% of the dose uh, in urine is unchanged and has extensive hepatic uh, uh, clearance. You guys actually very know the uh, mechanism of action, and uh, this is a drug that is actually uh, considered uh, cytotoxic. This is actually the typical uh, intravenous uh, pharmacokinetic uh, curve, and actually has a bimodal uh, uh, or biphasic actually manner. For the first uh, uh, 12 hours, which is more or less actually the half-life of paclitaxel, there is a systemic uh, co compartmental distribution, so essentially goes into the plasma to different compartments. And after that, the drug actually goes out from the systemic compartment uh, again, and, is, and then actually gets uh, uh, excreted. In general terms, actually, the uh, entire uh, half-life is around 50 hours. But the first, actually, uh, uh, half of the first order kinetics is approximately 12 hours. So in 12 hours, pretty much the drug uh, on a single bolus, 50% uh, of the drug is encountered uh, in plasma. A variety of organ systems can be impacted, producing a range of toxicities. If you actually give 
uh, paclitaxel intravenously and you essentially expect to see a side effect. The most common is bone marrow uh, toxicity, primary leukopenia, approximately happening in 11% of uh, the patients and is actually dose dependent. Uh, you see a, a wide actually list of potential uh, side effects, but if you actually see toxicity related to the drug, the first thing that you should see is bone marrow related toxicity. This is actually a, a figure that we tried to put together to, to uh, compare uh, intravenous paclitaxel infusion with drug coated balloons. And you actually see that concentration uh, uh, Cmax, which is essentially the peak of paclitaxel that you would find in blood, is actually below um, even the uh, detection limits of what you would actually consider therapeutic for the intravenous uh, formulation. You remember actually these curves here, which act actually is the typical pharmacokinetic profile, and you actually see here the Cmax for DCBs is pretty much actually very low compared to the infusion um, uh, uh, formulation. And actually it's difficult to compare head to head, but you actually see the Cmax of uh, drug coated balloons is really several orders of magnitude, whatever you want to call it um, in terms of numbers, but several orders of magnitude compared to uh, an intravenous infusion of paclitaxel. But balloons are actually different and the mechanism of action is different. Uh, paclitaxel is not really soluble when it's put on the surface of the balloon. And um, you actually, as part of the mechanism of action that we have described, the fragmentation of the coating, and particulate uh, containing actually solid phase uh, paclitaxel is essentially sent to the uh, systemic uh, formulation. So the pharmacodynamics of drug coat balloons are unique and depend on the concentration and solubility of the partic paclitaxel particle, which is different to what actually I just really showed you. After drug delivery uh, happens with balloon inflation, uh, some of the drug remains in the artery, and this is what actually I call an arterial compartment. Then there is an early systemic distribution, and actually other compartments essentially are created in the distal muscle. Some paclitaxel gets captured, some actually escapes and goes to the systemic compartment, and then there is a late systemic uh, clearance. So as you can actually see, this is not actually linear pharmacokinetics. Particle solubility has a lot to do with tissue uptake and distribution. We have shown this picture many, many times. And when this particle essentially gets adhered to the vessel wall, is responsible for uh, uh, transfer of the drug and actually tissue residency over time. So the particle solubility and type of particle is extremely important, not only at the vessel side of things, but also uh, systemically. We actually now know, we don't have a lot of data, but this is as much as we have right now, that the particles produced for most of the balloons uh, in use in the US actually have a very similar uh, solubility uh, profile. And drug dissolution rates being similar, I think the only difference would be what actually we call uh, input uh, drug dose. If you have more concentration, if you have more drug, you can produce more particles and therefore actually the biological effect may last actually longer. So what do we know about these compartments? This is all data uh, from the CODABANS uh, uh, program. This is the early systemic distribution in uh, patients undergoing uh, DCB application. And actually you see that after eight hours, pretty much paclitaxel is not detectable um, in plasma in actually these uh, patients. What about the muscle? We also know and uh, we have published that paclitaxel goes into the distal uh, uh, muscle, actually stays there. And according to the type of coating, actually some balloons may end up with more particles than others. But also we have, based on clinical data, there is not an increased amputation rate, at least on the SFA territory, uh, related to uh, the use of drug-coated balloons. And at the experimental model, the presence of paclitaxel in tissue does not really seem to actually delay uh, wound healing. What about the systemic compartment once these particles go uh, uh, everywhere and stay there? If you actually look at all data, and this has been reproduced uh, by others, you actually see that after uh, approximately six to nine months, the tissue levels of paclitaxel, even in the artery, but also in the muscle, liver, or kidney, are actually pretty much below the uh, curve of uh, quantification for uh, that actually uh, determine uh, biological uh, activity. This is actually my last slide before the conclusion, is why I think that Cassano's description of paclitaxel dose effect is way over simplistic, and we should stop talking about uh, dose effect. Uh, we cannot really talk about differences in dosages, just talking about paclitaxel concentration and balloon length, which are actually constant based on manufacturer uh, and actually user indication. 
but I put at least 10 variables that can really change the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of paclitaxel coated balloons. And this all depends on actually multiple biological, clinical, and technical uh, features. So to be honest, this is actually too complex to just simply reduce to a total input dose, and two is not better than three, and three is not actually worse than two. So this is a conversation we really need to have uh, in the future. So in conclusion, no question, paclitaxel is a cytotoxic drug and induce a constellation of systemic toxicities that are dose and time dependent. The pharmacokinetics are unique, nonlinear, and dependent on solubility profile of each coating. At the highest input dose, the use of DCB results in a lower uh, systemic exposure and transient multi-organ distribution and concentration. And systemic paclitaxel tissue concentrations following DCB use remain below the therapeutic threshold and unlikely exert a sustained biological effect over time. So a lot of people actually ask about my opinion, so I wanted to summarize this in on one slide. Is there a mortality signal? Apparently, actually, yes. The clinical data supports mechanistic insights. I don't really think that we can say that. The pharmacodynamics are different, absolutely, so we cannot really use the IV formulation to support the safety of drug-coated balloons. Is there actually paclitaxel systemic distribution? The answer is yes. Can paclitaxel remain in tissue for years? Scientifically, it is possible. But are the tissue levels actually higher than the therapeutic threshold for years? It is unlikely. Can we see a sustainable biological effect for years? It is actually unlikely, in my opinion. Can we establish a causal relationship, at least until now? My answer is no. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Juan. That was a great uh, introduction. Uh, next up, we're going to have uh, John Laird discuss uh, DCBs over the long term. Are they safe for our PA day patients? It's going to be the insights from the IMPACT DCB program. Thanks very much, Lawrence. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the IMPACT program than others, but we'll kind of just share some thoughts in general about, about the subject matter. So uh, these are my disclosures. And this is a disclosure slide that actually Peter put together, but I really feel kind of the same way he does about things. And so first off, you know, we both view drug eluding technologies as a major step forward in the treatment of peripheral artery disease, and we both treated hundreds of patients over the years since the approval of drug looting stents and drug coated balloons and have seen really dramatic, dramatically better clinical outcomes uh, with these drug looting technologies. So it has been a little bit of an earth-shaking uh, um, experience to have this meta-analysis come out and kind of shake our kind of core beliefs about, um, about drug looting technologies. We're both uh, co-PIs for the IMPACT SFA trial and we both have been and are advisors uh, for the companies that develop and manufacture these products. So we're obviously biased and, and to an extent conflicted. But that being said, you know, we took an oath to do no harm. And so if there is really a problem with these drug looting technologies and if we have missed something important uh, with regards to their safety, then, uh, then we, need to, we need to dig in deep and figure that out. If we talk about the meta-analysis, I think it's, you know, it's obviously flawed in many ways, uh, and it's derived from, from studies that are in many ways flawed. Uh, the majority of the trials that were done evaluating drug looting devices were powered for short-term patency and not for long-term mortality. They often had small control groups, and many of these trials were two-to-one randomization schemes, and so you had a small number of patients that were actually treated with PTA. So we're paying the price for trying to do trials that, um, to keep, keep them less expensive because these trials are very expensive to do. We tried to do the smallest trial possible to show effectiveness, and uh, now it's turned out to be a double-edged sword. We've seen attrition over the years in these trials, and when you start out with a small number and you lose patients over the time, over time that certainly impacts your ability to, to make determinations about mortality and safety. Uh, there's missing data, uh, sensors, censored patients weren't accounted for in the meta-analysis. There were assumptions about drug kinetics and doses which were probably not correct. And I think it was probably not a great idea to include drug looting stents and drug coated balloons in the same analysis. As we'll talk about, there's a potentially chance results with regards to 
lower mortality in the balloon angioplasty arm of the IMPACT SFA trial. And then one of the things that I think really needs to be dug into deeper is to look and see how many patients in the control arm of the trial actually got a paclitaxel eluting device along the way, particularly since there was such a high TLR rate in many of these trials. And uh, if you actually just think about it a little bit, probably many of these patients had contralateral disease that was treated along the way and maybe was treated with a drug looting stent or a drug coated balloon. And in the uh, New Zealand experience, Andrew Holland, when he looked at his patient experience, 40% of the control patients treated in his uh, experience did have treatment with a drug coated balloon over the ensuing two years. So in many of these cases, uh, the, the PTA control arms were not truly just PTA uh, patients. Trying to put the mortality rates into some context I think is important as well. If we look over the series of SFA device trials over, over the past uh, five to 10 years, we see actually the highest mortality rate ever reported was in a drug looting stent trial, but that was a serolimus eluting uh, stent. One of the other highest reported mortality rates in a DCB trial was the control arm in the uh, Levant 1 trial, 12.2% mortality. The very lowest mortality ever, ever seen, and, and probably truly an aberration, was the extremely low mortality rate seen in the PTA control arm of IMPACT SFA, which no doubt impacted the mortality disparities that were seen in that trial. But if you look at the DCB arms of, of these trials overall, they kind of fall right where you'd expect them to fall compared to other device trials, and also much lower mortality rate that's been seen in some of the historical uh, control studies looking at symptomatic PAD patients over time. If we go back and look at IMPACT SFA, the randomized trial, we talked about this this morning, there was numerical differences with regards to all-cause mortality at five years, but those differences were not statistically different. And some of these low rates in the PTA arm, as we've already talked about, were due in part to a really remarkably low uh, rate of uh, death in, the, in that arm of the trial. And if you look at the relationship between paclitaxel dose and mortality rate, there is none. Uh, patients who died, survived, and lost a follow-up all had received the same dose of paclitaxel. Much has also been made about the impact of DEEP trial over time, and this was a, a trial of a drug-coated balloon, the Medtronic platform in patients with critical limb ischemia, uh, based on uh, a signal towards uh, worse outcomes and more amputations in the DCB group. That product was actually taken off the market. And at the time, there did appear to be a signal towards more mortality in the DCB arm of the trial at one year. But at five years, there was actually more deaths in the PTA control arm of the trial. There'll be more talk about this, but there's been subsequent publications since the publication of the meta-analysis showing that uh, in large uh, sample of Medicare patients, there was no differences in mortality in patients treated with drug-coated balloons versus standard balloons, and no difference in mortality between patients treated with drug-looting stents and bare metal stents. Now, we published uh, this paper uh, from the IMPACT program looking at paclitaxel exposure and, and safety. And basically, we looked at all of the patients treated and randomized the randomized trials, the two randomized trials, uh, IMPACT SFA and IMPACT Japan, and in the prospective registries, IMPACT China and IMPACT Global. So basically, an interesting cross-section of patients from the US, Europe, Japan, and China, and we analyzed all the baseline procedural and follow-up data for these patients, so patient-level data, compared survival and mortality between the treatment groups with that patient-level data, looked at paclitaxel doses and their association with survival and mortality, and also talked about or tested some alternative hypotheses for the numerically higher mortality rate in the DCP um, patients treated. First off, uh, the group was 
uh, separated into tercels based on the dose of uh, paclitaxel that they received. And we saw really no relationship between mortality and paclitaxel dose again. Actually, the patients who had the, in the highest tercel dose actually had the highest freedom from all-cause mortality at five years out uh, from uh, the procedure. If we looked at the independent predictors of mortality in the IMPACT program, we saw a number of things that uh, predicted mortality, but paclitaxel dose was not one of them. There was no uh, relationship between paclitaxel dose and mortality in that uh, Cox regression analysis. Juan already talked about this, so I won't belabor it, but if you look at the kind of the estimates of a dose that's received with one six millimeter uh, diameter, 120 millimeter long drug coat of boon, we see orders of magnitude less uh, than the dose seen in patients who are receiving uh, several treatments with Taxol or Paclitaxel for breast carcinoma. So it's, and these patients are not showing signs of, of excess mortality compared to patients not treated with Paclitaxel. Um, so it's hard to really tie the dose on these balloons to, uh, to uh, complications and mortality. So one of the alternative hypotheses uh, generated was that if you have patients who are having a higher recurrence rate after a procedure, they're going to have more contacts with the healthcare system because they're going to have more symptoms. They're going to come in, undergo more visits and more procedures. And in fact, because of that increased contact with the healthcare system, they're probably going to get better medical care and better, and better treatments. And this is just showing from the IMPACT program that for every time period along the way, uh, the patients in the PTA arm of the trial had higher clinic visit compliance than those in the DCB arm of the trial. And why is that important? Well, if they're getting seen more often, they're probably getting more, uh, more likely to get dual antiplatelet therapy, maybe more likely to get statins and some of the other beneficial therapies. Uh, Aaron and Armstrong and I, uh, when we were at UC Davis together, looked at the importance of medical therapy in patients with symptomatic PAD. And in a relatively small cohort from our database, we saw, we saw that patients who received guidelines directed therapy had better survival and freedom from MACE than those who did not get uh, guidelines directed therapy after their procedures. Patients who received statins compared to those that did not get statins had uh, lower mortality and low, lower MACE uh, compared to uh, patients who were not treated appropriately with statin therapy. And patients that got dual antiplatelet therapy actually had better survival than those that did not get dual antiplatelet therapy. And when we go look again at the patients in the IMPACT uh, program, we see uh, through all of the time periods the patients in the PTA arm of the trial were more likely to be receiving dual antiplatelet therapy than patients in the, uh, the DCB arm of the trial. Again, a possible hypothesis for some of the differences in mortality seen. So in conclusion, the meta-analysis has clear limitations. Some of the newer data is not consistent with this danger signal. There are important alternative hypotheses for the differences in mortality that are seen. There will be more new data coming, including more patient level meta-analyses, uh, data from Europe, uh, VQI, VA, and Kaiser. Obviously a very important FDA panel coming up next week. But hopefully we can work together to get to the bottom uh, of this. And hopefully at the end of the day, we'll determine that paclitaxel is not a danger to our patients because I think from the standpoint of reducing procedures and Restenosis, they've been clearly shown to be effective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Laird. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give the next lecture um, on Stellarex. I think I think I, I want to just echo the sentiments I think of most of the leaders in the room um, in, in of these clinical trials that you know we've seen the the efficacy of, of these drugs and how they've made a difference in the lives of our patients. So therefore, it's it's very difficult to see this this happening, especially when we don't really believe it's based on science. But my my charge today is to talk about the um, the Stellarex uh, uh, program, 
the long-term safety data from the Celerex DCB program. I know that uh, we're a little bit out of order. I apologize to our AV crew. Okay, is it up? I think it's coming up. There it is. Great. Um, so I'm, I'm giving this on behalf of myself and Sean Leiden, um, who, uh, who, who we both uh, led this, uh, the American um, arm of the study, as well as by my uh, international PIs, Dr. Zeller, as well. So, so, so I think, you know, this, this talk is going to be a little different than Dr. Laird's talk. What we really want to talk about is what is a, the safety signals in, in this particular trial. I know Dr. Gray and a big consortium, including Dr. Razavi, you know, uh, led uh, the analysis of the safety. So I want to give them a lot of uh, kudos as well. But, but the Stellarix angioplasty balloon is, is a little bit different as, as, as the one common denominator among all the products that we're talking is, is paclitaxel. As Dr. Granada said, uh, you know, the, the formulation of product paclitaxel matters, whether it's a, a crystalline or an amorphous, and this particular balloon is a hybrid formulation of both amorphous and cr crystalline uh, paclitaxel, and the excipient also differs among all the balloons uh, that are available, and obviously the drug-coated stents also differ in how they, they um, deliver the drug to the vessel. But in, the, in this particular balloon, uh, the excipient was polyethylene glycol, uh, which, which has a high affinity to, to hydroxyl apatite and also limits washout in the, in the presence of, of calcium. So what, what is the, the background of this, the clinical program? So, so the Illuminate clinical trials were met their safety endpoints with significantly lower, lower major adverse events, either individual or composite, versus either the, the, the PTA arms. Of, 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 over 2,300 patients were treated with stellar rates in, in, in all the uh, DCB arms, and, and, and the independent CC and adverse events uh, were, were, were adjudicated, and there was no device uh, or procedure-related mortality, okay? So what we're looking at when we talk about this, we're, the, the particular study that I'm talking about is looking at the two randomized controlled trials, the Illuminate EURCT, uh, which was done in Europe, uh, and the Illuminate Pivotal, which was done here in the US. Um, the, the patients from these trials were po pooled with a total of 589 patients to, to compare mortality through three years between the Stellarex DCB and the PTA cohorts. So the number that we looked at in the drug-coated balloon arm was 419, and the PTA arm was 100. And 70, again, reflecting what Dr. Laird talked about, the two-to-one randomizations. These RCTs included a group ma uh, mainly composed of claudicans. So this is the claudicans population that we're looking at. And, uh, and uh, so, so that's important to remember. So the, how, how this analysis was done was there was an independent third-party systemic, uh, a systematic assessment of all available mortality data from all the Stellarex DCB above the knee uh, clinical studies and registries. Um, the the, the pre-specified pooled data analysis of patients treated with Stellarex for all the above knees, and the two randomized controlled trials were looked at. And also a separate integ integrated analysis of mortality rates in patients treated with the Stellarex DCBs of the above knee lesions from all the studies beside these two randomized controlled trials. So as you can see in the pooled analysis, uh, the baseline patient characteristics, there was, there was really a minimal difference between, between the, the, uh, the, the patient populations that were looked at. And what's important when we get to the meat of it, when you look at the randomized controlled trials, meaning the URCT and the, and the US trial, the mortality through three years uh, through, uh, showed no difference at one year, two year, three years for all cause death, cardiovascular death, or non-cardiovascular death. And then when you, when you look at the individually reported mortalities between the Illuminate Pivotal as well as the Illuminate EURCT, it also mimics uh, that finding. So again, you can see here there was no difference between DCB and PTA in all-cause mortality through three years in the, in the Stellarex uh, data. And if you look at the pooled analysis of both the trials, again, there was no difference in cardiovascular mortality uh, through, through, through three years. Now, Stellarex, uh, it's important to remember that the data from Stellarex has only been analyzed out to three years at this time, so we're waiting to do further analysis uh, like the impact uh, study has done. So um, if you look at non-cardiovascular mortality through three years again, in this particular uh, studies, in these studies, there was no, no difference in cardiovascular, non-cardiovascular mortality. And if you look at what caused the death, the top five causes of death were, were infections and, and, and infestations, respiratory, thoracic, mediastinal, uh, neoplasms, and general disorders, and cardiac disorders. Again, you can see that these varied among, among whether it's a DCB or, or a PTA that, that, that was, uh, was the patient who passed away. 
So if you look at mortality, well, I went through this already, I apologize. Here we go. So if you look at all cause mortality treated with DCBs from all pool trials, meaning the non-randomized control trials and the randomized control trials, again, you can see there's absolutely no difference in all cause death at one, two, and three years. Again, uh, for cardiovascular death at one, two, and three years, and non-cardiovascular death uh, through, through the three years as well. Again, again, uh, we hate to beat down the point, but I think it's important to hammer down the, the fact that there is no difference. All studies, um, all course mortality through three years, again, showed no difference uh, in, in both cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular mortality. So, so if you if you look at and you look at it in a pie chart, there are multiple causes of why these patients died, right? So, 22% died of cardiac disorders, 24% died of neoplasm, um, or, or or benign or malignant, um, respiratory, thoracic, and uh, mediastinal issues were 9%. General disorders were 11, and undetermined were 22. So it's very hard when you go backwards uh, to try to analyze why these patients died. I mean, sometimes, as you know, as uh, physicians and clinicians, when we put down that patient died, we, we say cardiac arrest. We say, you know, uh, whatever that, that may be, sepsis. Some really sort of broad, uh, broad strokes are painted. So it's hard to go backwards to find, but this is what uh, they did a lot of hard work in, in trying to identify this. So in conclusion, uh, when it comes to the Stellarex data set, and the hard work done by the good folks there, the, this, indep this independent third-party pooled analysis of patient-level data confirms and reinforces the safety pro profile of the Stellarex DCB. The Stellarex randomized control trial demonstrated low mortality through three years uh, with the DCB uh, group comparable to one of the largest PTA cohorts. But again, I think it's early because it's only three-year data. We have five-year data with some of our other, other balloons and stents that have been out longer. Uh, important to remember there was no, no difference in all-course cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular mortality uh, in, in, in either the pooled randomized control analysis or the full aggregate cohort of 2,351 patients treated with Stellarex. So I, I think it's very important to, to, to emphasize that, uh, you know, that the, there is growing evidence, and I think everybody here in this room is working really hard towards trying to show that the safety of, the, of these balloons uh, is, is, is definitely there and that, that these patients should receive this as a, as a primary care of therapy. And you see in, in, our, in, our, in our cases, both from Leipzig as well as here, we've been using a lot of drug-coded technology. Obviously, what we do is getting consents from our patients prior to, at least in, in here in Mount Sinai, but, uh, but, but in general, I think it's important to remember that this is ongoing, and as Dr. Laird said, uh, next week will be a, a very important step, uh, hopefully, towards uh, you know going on uh, with with the uh, advancement of our field. Thank you very much. Next up uh, is our co-director. Uh, uh, Dirk uh, Scheinert out of Leipzig, uh, long-term data of the Lutonix DCB formulation. Dirk. Thank you. Um, I want to show you briefly some of the uh, data available from uh, the uh, Levant uh, clinical trial program. Well, as you know, clearly uh, the Lutonix balloon is probably was, was the first approved in the United States and there, one with the longest uh, track record, probably also the most clinical indications for SFA instant, recent lung lesions, and AV shunts, and there are more than 200,000 patients treated uh, worldwide or, um, um, uh, clinically in, in trials and in clinical use. Uh, well, Paclitaxel, a lot has been said about this, so I don't want to go into this. It's uh, clearly Lutonix balloon is also using Paclitaxel. Um, it was uh, tested extensively uh, preclinically to finally come up with the optimized uh, Lutonix coating, uh, which, uh, as you know, uses um, uh, a, a relatively low dose paclitaxel concentration of uh, uh, two microgram per square millimeters, and uh, it was actually uh, tested in uh, uh, GLP porcine studies, of course, for. Uh, uh, downstream effects, which, which have been discussed uh, um, uh, quite, quite, quite uh, intensively, but also for system systemic toxicity and basically data support the use of uh, um, balloons for up to one meter treated lesion. Um, the uh, serum paclitaxel level is less than three nanogram per milliliter at one hour, and there's a very rapid. Uh, uh, elimination with a mean elimination half time of 46.8 uh, hours. 
Um, so this uh, slide summarizes basically the data points from all the uh, uh, Lutonix trials. Uh, basically here on this in this table, all the randomized trials, the Levant one, the uh, the, the whole Levant cohorts, uh, which have a, uh, a follow up uh, out to a six uh, out to five years. Uh, the randomized trial in Japan and the uh, randomized incendiary stenosis trial. And basically, in none of the trials, uh, uh, any significant difference has been seen in all cause death. Um, and also, the observed rates uh, in, in, in the registries, as shown here, long lesion registry in the global registry, are within the expected, um, within the expected range. Um, this is uh, uh, the uh, all called death rate for the, uh, for the, from the Levant 2 studies, um, basically showing a uh, non significant difference uh, at uh, five years. However, uh, clearly a slight trend here in, uh, with a so somewhat higher uh, mortality in the DCB arm. Um, however, uh, we clearly have to look also at the numbers at risk and uh, very clearly due to the randomization scheme and uh, the fact that, of course, uh, um, the more patients were entered, uh, more DCB patients were entered into the registries, the numbers uh, which basically represent the um, data foundation for the DCB curve are uh, much more profound. And, of course, in the PTA arm, uh, we are dealing here with a as in all these studies, I think, with a relatively small uh, control group, which, of course, can be affected by individual uh, yeah, numbers uh, very strongly. Um, well, if we look specifically at the hypothesis that an increased uh, paclitaxel dose could lead to a higher mortality, as, as, as uh, stipulated by Katsanos, uh, uh, we looked at uh, the um, different dose groups in the Lutonix, uh, uh, in the Levant 2 trials, basically and on the low dose uh, group on a, and, and, and basically in four quartiles, as you can see here, uh, up to uh, a high dose group. And basically, uh, we can see that the uh, all-cause death rate uh, in all these groups is uh, quite comparable, in fact, statistically uh, not different. So there's no higher mortality observed here at all. Uh, in, in, in the higher dose groups compared to the lower dose groups, and that is, was done with a binary analysis, and here on the right with a Kaplan-Meier anal analysis, which uh, uh, gives uh, kind of the same uh, findings. Another uh, analysis which was carried out was to look at the all-cause mortality by time that's shown here in the table on the right, on the right side. Basically, you can see here the comparative uh, uh, death rates at one year, two years, three years, four out to five years. And you can see that actually at no time point uh, there was a statistically significant difference. Um, and uh, in general, of course, we, uh, it's difficult to, to, to say what we expect. But if you look at data points from uh, uh, historical literature, then uh, I think all the data points shown here in, in, in this study and also in the other studies which have been reported today are actually uh, quite, quite low compared to some of the numbers reported uh, for PAD, typical PAD um, uh, cohorts. Well, uh, what was causing the deaths? Uh, also, this was, of course, analyzed, and you can see here the display in the table. Um, cardiovascular death uh, was uh, relevant in about 3 to 5% of the cases. Um, and other than that, really nothing is, 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 uh, you know, uh, is uh, catching really attention here. I mean, they're all well distributed, uh, the causes uh, uh, over the two groups. So in summary, um, we can say that uh, the Lutonix balloon, of course, was designed for safety. It's a, it's a coating which uses a low, uh, low uh, paclitaxel dose density. It's rapidly cleared from, uh, the, from the blood. Um, and basically, this uh, studies showed no difference of all cause deaths between DCB and PTA uh, in general, and also not by dose, um, and not at, at any uh, of the time points between one and uh, five years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, next up, it'll be uh, Mahmoud Razavi, who will be uh, describing the long-term safety 
information on paclitaxel eluding stents, insights from the Zilver PTX program. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. So uh, the, uh, uh, oh, okay, so we're sort of cut here. Thank you. No financial relationship to Cook, and this is based on a presentation initially given the, by Dr. Michael Dick, who's one of, one of the co-PIs of this study at the link this year. Um, the, uh, everybody knows uh, that the design of this study uh, was uh, that, that the suboptimal angioplasties uh, could be uh, receiving uh, Zebra PTX later on. Uh, but most importantly, the patients in the optimal group that required intervention during the first year could get Zebra PTX. So, uh, we would know in this study, since this became available, at the time of this study, there were no drug-coated balloons available in the U.S., we know that probably the patients that did not get uh, uh, any drug-eluting uh, technologies were paclitaxel naive uh, at, this, at this point. So total number of patients that actually did receive uh, Zelber PTX after a year, there were another 30 patients in this group that got Zelber PTX and one uh, in this group. So the total were 336 patients in this study that were exposed to paclitaxel. The remainder, uh, it's safe to assume that they were paclitaxel naive and they had no exposure because in the US there was no paclitaxel balloons available at the time. And among those patients, when we analyzed the uh, mortality of those 336 patients that did get paclitaxel in the first year versus those who didn't, as you can see, mortality rates are very similar. The causes of mortality, as you look at it, also, uh, also if you look at the, uh, uh, the analysis, there was no difference between the two groups. Uh, in terms of the patient characteristics of the entities that can, can impact uh, uh, death rate. Now, remember, this is also an uh, analysis in, in uh, uh, sort of five different groups, different uh, doses from about 0.3 milligram to three milligrams in this study, it's important to know that these studies were not powered for this kind of analysis. However, to the extent that it counts, as you can see, there was no dose relationship in this study, either very similar to uh, the other two analyses, three analyses you just saw. In terms of cardiovascular uh, versus other mortalities, no difference. And if we throw in uh, patients uh, with the Zilver uh, BMS study, which was another uh, Zilver uh, study that had five-year outcome, again, no difference uh, between the, those that got Pacitaxel in this platform and those who didn't. Additional bare metals, this is, this is the uh, mortality rate of that study we just talked about. Uh, mortality rate very similar to the, PAC, the uh, uh, Zilver PTX data. Uh, other studies, this is coming from the uh, Japan PMS study, same thing. Now, in this uh, study, remember, CLI patients were included. That's why the uh, five-year uh, death uh, is higher uh, in these patients. But to the three-year where there was control uh, outcome, control people outcome uh, patients, there was no difference in the two groups. If you look at the uh, uh, studies in the Claudicans, again, uh, no difference, and if you break it down by uh, CLI, again, no difference between the two sides. Mortality rate from the literature. It's important to put this, these mortalities in context. We've been talking about comparing uh, the mortalities of these patients who got back to tax uh, technologies to uh, control groups, which in many cases are much smaller uh, than, than uh, those who did. But what is the mortality of patients in the pop pa general patient population uh, who have peripheral arterial disease or claudication? And this is the range that you find in the literature for both CLI and claudication. And you can see it's very much similar to what these studies observed, all of them. So it's not something that stands out or that's unusual. And put it in form of a summary, these are all the Zilver PTX data to five years, and, to three years and five years. These are the bare metal stents, and these are the mortalities in the literature of uh, similar patient populations. Very similar. Again, I don't know about, at this point what the fuss is all about because it truly is no difference that we see here. So patient level data analyzed randomized controlled trials in this, uh, in the Zebra PTX showed no difference, however you cut it uh, uh, in, in, uh, in terms of mortality. And the, uh, the, the good thing, or the unique thing about this study is that fairly uh, uh, convincingly, we could say that the control patients were in fact uh, paclitaxel naive. Uh, so the analysis would be pure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mahmoud, great job. 
Um, next up will uh, be the Alluvia DES and Ranger DCB program presented by uh, Bill Gray. Bill. Thanks, Lawrence. And while I have uh, Derek and uh, Prakash here, thanks for having me as part of the faculty. So waiting for the slides to come up. They are. Nope. Wrong slide set. Can you put the other one on? That's it. Thanks. And now it's not moving. Can you advance the slide? I think I'm still on the other timer. I don't know if that makes a difference or not. There you go. Uh, I'm a consultant to Boston Scientific. That's my disclosure. I, ran, I uh, was a principal investigator for the uh, global uh, Luvia trial. So um, here are the sponsored studies from uh, Boston Scientific of the paclitaxel eluding devices. First is the Illuvia drug eluding stent, uh, the majestic first in human, the imperial randomized pivotal trial, the eminent uh, and regal trials, which are currently enrolling. One is randomized and one is single arm. The Ranger uh, DCB paclitaxel coated balloon uh, has a randomized trial. It's in three year follow up in 2019, and Ranger 2 pivotal trial. Um, when your follow-up in 2019, ongoing for five years. And then there's a below-the-need uh, program for, called the Saval, which is a drug-eluting uh, stent, uh, very much like the um, SFA, but uh, designed for the uh, infrapopetial vessels. It has both randomized and single-arm phases, and it's currently enrolling. So here's the uh, Alluvia drug-eluting stent data set. Um, first, it's a fairly low... Uh, um, concentration of paclitaxel on the stent surface, 0.167 micrograms per millimeter squared. Um, the, the FDA approved this stent in September of 2018. It received CE mark over two years prior. It's a self-expanding stent on a purpose-built Lenovo stent platform with a biostable polymer mixture and the uh, dosing that I mentioned before. Here's the clinical trial program of Alluvia. Um, the pivotal multicenter imperial trial, 465 patients randomized two to one worldwide with one year follow-up comp complete, reported, and published. Two-year data should be available sometime in the next couple of months. The Majestic trial was the first in human, 57 patient trial, and three-year follow-up is complete. Uh, the remaining are enrolling and we don't have data for them. So here's the Majestic trial data set, um, fairly typical. Uh, uh, a patient population um, uh, with uh, multiple comorbid risk factors. And the summary of all deaths in Majestic out to three years is that uh, there was exactly two deaths out of 55 patients in follow-up. Uh, one of those was cardiac and one of them was non-cardiac. Uh, specifically, a patient died in a nursing home due to cardiac uh, death, so a patient was obviously frail and ill. And the other one was a complication from metastatic squamous cell carcinoma and adjudicated as a non-cardiovascular death. Um, the Imperial Clinic, Clinical Study Overview has been discussed at length uh, in prior talks today. I'm not going to go through this again, uh, except to reiterate that it was a 2 to 1 randomization against another paclitaxel device. So we don't have a, uh, a non-paclitaxel horse in this race. Um, as, re as relates to the baseline pa uh, patient characteristics, you see there's really no differences. Uh, among the various sets of patients, both in the randomized trial as well as the long lesion subset and the PK uh, numbers. Uh, here are the summary of deaths in the randomized control arm for both arms. Uh, for uh, all, all deaths were adjudicated in Luvia at 2%, 2 for Zilber PTX, 3.9%. This is at one year. Cardiac deaths, um, where there was three in the Luvia arm and there were three non-cardiac deaths in the Luvia arm as well. For Zilver, um, the majority of deaths were in the, um, in the uh, ca cardiac category and one vascular death. And if we look at the causes of death, I'm not going to read them off, so you can take a breath. Um, the, they're, they're largely unremarkable in terms of any clustering. We don't see any, we see them fairly uh, robustly distributed across the entire uh, spectrum of, of causes of death. PK study is important. We're talking about paclitaxel, um, which is a pharmacokinetic distribution in the body and illumination. It is not radiation. It does not sit in the body and, and have a long half-life. So it's, uh, we have to acknowledge that it's a pharmacological dose. For all patients treated with alluvia in this, in this sub-study, uh, 13 patients, uh, plasma paclitaxel was not quantifiable. That is, it was less than one billionth of a milliliter 
in 11 out of 13 patients at 10 minutes. And in all patients, at subsequent time points, it was non-detectable, 30 minutes and then all the hours that followed that. So uh, paclitaxel in the plasma was not available um, after 10 minutes in the majority of patients. One-year mortality in paclitaxel for the paclitaxel-treated patients in both the long lesion and um, the uh, pharmacokinetic study were zero uh, in, at one year. Now, moving to the Ranger DCB program, uh, this is a two microgram per millimeter square paclitaxel uh, drug. Um, Ranger uh, SFA trial has three-year data available for follow-up, and we're gonna look at that now. So you see here, this is a randomized trial of two to one and a relatively small trial, 100 patients. And you see that um, the characteristics are not different among the two, save for smoking, which was more prevalent in the control arm. Um, here are the summary of deaths. Um, for all deaths in the three, at three year time point, there were um, nine deaths out of 65, 13%, 14% in Ranger, and about 11% in, in the PTA arm. Again, no obvious clustering of deaths uh, as compared to, um, uh, to each other. Rather. So if you look at the, uh, the deaths here, again, I'm not gonna read them all off, but uh, some cardiac, some non-cardiac deaths, there's one, two, three cancers out of the nine deaths here, and there's um, some multi-system organ failure, cardiac de decompensation in the control arm. So pretty uh, unremarkable uh, display of, of, of death uh, causes. So in conclusions, uh, mortality rates with alluvia were not greater than contemporary rates observed with non-drug-coded device. Um, for the imperial trial, it was 2% versus the control of 2.3%. Uh, as adjudicated by literature, and 3.6% um, majestic versus 3.8 two-year control. Uh, so that's three-year versus two-year. Three-year mortality in the randomized Ranger SFA study did not differ between paclitaxel and non-paclitaxel arms, and patient-level data reveals similar causes of death for paclitaxel and non-paclitaxel treated patients. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Uh, next up will be uh, oh, Suhail uh, Parikh from Crosstown Traffic, uh, Association of Survival and Femoral, po uh, Femoral Popliteal Artery Revascularization with Drug-Coded Devices. I want to thank you, and uh, Pika and Dirk, thanks for the kind invitation. Uh, I'm going to present some data, actually, on behalf of Eric Sosemski and colleagues. Eric is here in the room, so if you have any questions, ask him. Um, these are my disclosures. And uh, I want to uh, present two manuscripts that uh, this consortium of investigators put together with Eric and Bobby Ye's uh, guidance, the first of which was published uh, online February 12th of this year, uh, and the title is Association of Survival uh, with Femoral Popliteal Artery Re Revascularization with Drug-Coded Devices. These data were uh, presented in the, the, the manuscript uh, in JAMA Cardiology, and, and what you will see is uh, collated data from Medicare databases uh, looking at a series of patients who received uh, both drug-eluting stents and drug-coated balloons using the ICD-10 paradigm. So these are inpatients in a region of the United States. And what you'll notice is that the baseline characteristics uh, of age is consistent with a Medicare population, 73 years of age, roughly predominantly me uh, um, both men uh, and, and predominantly women, actually, uh, Caucasian, uh, and with a high prevalence of critical limb ischemia. And, and a burden of diabetes, uh, which is concomitant uh, with that presentation. Um, in order to, to uh, regularize the uh, types of hospitals uh, that were represented, uh, bed size was uh, uh, considered as well as metropolitan or non-metropolitan teaching or non-teaching hospital status. And you can see that uh, there's relatively uh, equal distribution. And the, the take home slide from this uh, manuscript really is that there was no significant difference and slightly, in fact, uh, a, a crude risk of reduction with the use of drug-eluting technologies at a median follow-up uh, just under two years. And so if you look uh, at uh, Medicare uh, beneficiaries, about half of whom are CLI patients, um, there was no difference in terms of uh, mortality uh, at this uh, relatively long-term follow-up. When uh, looking at balloon angioplasty, um, again, there was uh, no difference in the, in the plain old balloon angioplasty versus 
uh, DCB arms. Um, and uh, again, similarly, uh, with uh, drug eluding stents, uh, uh, predominantly the Zilver PTX device compared to uh, bare metal nitinol self-expanding stents, there is no difference. I think what is striking is that in this cohort of patients, there is a mortality approaching one third at such a short uh, near-term follow-up. And this is reflective of the patient population that we're treating here in the contemporary practice. Uh, and again, if you look at the critical limb patient population, the mortality hazard at less than 600 days approaches 40%. So this is an extremely high-risk patient population, and again, is reflective of our clinical practice here in the United States. Uh, again, without CLI, uh, this is about a third uh, mortality. So the conclusion from the first manuscript was that there was no difference in survival between drug-coded and uncoded devices, and this was uh, uh, when uh, reviewed via device type uh, or CLI status. Uh, and the follow-up data was admittedly short uh, at 600 days, largely because the ICD-10 paradigm had only recently been introduced in the United States. And it was with the granularity of ICD-10 that we were able to discriminate between drug-coated balloons and drug-eluting stents. So uh, as a follow-up to this, um, Eric uh, and his team, uh, which included several of us, looked at uh, ICD-9 paradigms, which went back many more years and included the initiation of drug looting technologies here in the United States. And in this analysis, over 51,000 Medicare beneficiaries uh, were reviewed who had received drug looting stents, again, Zilver PTX, or bare metal nitinol self-expanding stents between the years of 2012 and 15, uh, with the FDA approval of Zilver PTX having just preceded this. All-cause mortality was reviewed with a median follow-up of two years and the longest follow-up of 4.1 years. And again, using the ICD-9 uh, paradigm, uh, we were able to identify the use of DES in a non-coronary vessel. Here's the, the summary data, again, with a follow-up out to 1,440 days. You can see uh, the jaw-dropping mortality of approximately 50% in both cohorts of patients with similar patient characteristics as I showed earlier. But again, no difference between the uh, drug-eluting versus non-drug-eluting technologies. Uh, and there was, no, again, no survival hazard. And the confidence intervals are relatively narrow because of the large data set. Um, when stratified by critical limb ischemia status, you can see, obviously, as would, one would expect, that the non-CLI patients have a much lower hazard of mortality. However, there's no difference between the two groups. And again, this subsumes some 50,000 patients uh, in the United States. And so the conclusions from this manuscript uh, and really the pair of manuscripts is that among Medicare beneficiaries, there's no difference in, in relatively midterm or long-term outcomes uh, in terms of all-cause mortality uh, in those patients treated with drug-coded versus uncoded devices. And this relationship persisted between device types, both DCB and, and DES, and those with and without critical limb ischemia. I certainly would encourage you to come to uh, Eric's talk later this afternoon, where he'll be, uh, as I understand, unveiling some new data and some updates to these data. And certainly, I, I understand that uh, next week's FDA panel, he'll be dropping even more data. So, so there's more to come. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sahel, and thank you, Eric. Um, for uh, pinch hitting for Chris Metzger uh, will be uh, Bill Gray again. It'll be a discussion of the risk of death following application of paclitaxel coated balloons and stents in the femoral popliteal artery. Findings from a meta analysis. Actually, this is going to be a little bit different. This is going to be a critique of that meta analysis because I think we're all familiar with the meta analysis. And Chris asked me to stand in last minute, so I put this together. Uh, it's a 20 minute talk. I'll try to do in 10. So. Uh, Everybody's, uh, everybody's familiar with the, with the data set. I'm not going to go through it, but um, this, was the, um, this was the data set. At one year, 28 studies, you can see there was no difference in death uh, in the Katsanos analysis. It was a well-selected group of patients and, uh, and studies. At two years now, with 12 studies remaining not out of the original 28, there started to be uh, what was considered to be a signal and a hazard ratio which approached uh, significance now, not crossing the line of identity. And at five years with three out of the original 28 uh, studies, there was a, um, a hazard ratio also statistically significant in um, showing a potential for paclitaxel do uh, death. Um, there was also a, uh, a construct that showed that paclitaxel dosing, according to the authors, led to more dose, and more dosing led to more death. 
That was done because it was a proof of concept. It's one thing to so, show an association, but to show causation, you have to show some dose responsiveness, and that's why they went to this modeling. The modeling I will show you is problematic. So unfortunately, I think the, uh, the exclamatory um, um, title probably didn't belie the strength of this, um, this uh, uh, analysis. Uh, it says the increased risk of death following application of paclitaxel balloons and stents. Um, it, it, there is an increased risk and further investigations are urgently warranted. Well, let's talk about how good this data set was. Um, at, it is summer level data, it's not patient level data. So all they could do is take the numbers arithmetically from the papers that were in the literature and use them mathematically to look at a, an assessment. Because it's not a patient level data set, it can only really be hypothesis generating. It is not a definitive statement around uh, fact. Since no, and there's no cause of death that can be assessed or reported because it wasn't available to the authors. And no time to event analysis can be constructed, and I'm glad this talk comes after um, Sahil's because um, you saw those graphs from the Sosemsky um, papers, and you see them fairly steady uh, separation or uh, commingling. You don't see them waving back and forth with um, different death rates, uh, differences throughout. And that's typical of a, um, a time to event curve. You don't see movement in the curve uh, in general. So um, because you couldn't see that in this uh, uh, representation of the data, it was uh, limited in its um, interpretation. So there are multiple meta-analytic issues. I'm not a statistician, but I play one for purposes of these uh, talks. Um, there's a selection bias due to lack of complete trial inclusion. As I said before, and I'm just gonna go to this, here's the, the just look at the, bulk, the visuals on this. The bulk of the data, 28, 12, and three, um, what you don't realize is that if you look at these three studies back here at one year, they actually show a difference in mortality uh, with a paclitaxel signal at one year. So if you carry those same trial forward to five years and don't have any of the rest of them to balance it out, you will continue to see a signal. But because it's select, that, that represents a selection and therefore problematic, especially without that Kaplan-Meier curve that I showed you would be important in that analysis. The meta-analytic issue number two is that the dose, dose time product treats this, as I mentioned in my prior talk, as a radiation dose without any uh, half or with a very extended half-life. So the exposure is the dose times the, the balloon size times time, and time in this case is the time of follow-up. So if you had follow-up for one year, two years, three years, five years, that was the time uh, variable that was inserted into that equation. That's a big deal. It, uh, pharmacologic dosing is not like that. It doesn't last for years. It, it's not radiation. It's not a particle that emits for forever. And there's a lot of problems with that. So uh, the aforementioned bias of selection actually works against this. So what, what happens is you start selecting out the worst patient populations, those three studies that at one year showed a signal, now at five years show a signal, and they actually ended up having according to the authors, more doses, and therefore they had worse outcomes. But they weren't balanced by other uh, similar dosed um, devices. Note that the dosing for DES, specifically Zilver, was incorrectly assigned. Zilver is a stent, not a balloon. So the surface coverage is about 25%, not 100%. So the dosing has to be down-regulated. And the authors actually knew that before they published, but they published anyway using that dose formula. And that's problematic uh, at a minimum for a variety of reasons. Uh, the dose product is also problematic because any patient getting a, a, a paclitaxel device, the dosing will be different. And it will be different for a variety of reasons, even with the same device. Operator handling, how much they manipulate the device, the transit time through the sheath and into the vessel and how it interacts with the valve in that sheath. The inflation time and pressure may be variable by, by operator. The excipient efficiency will be different among the balloons. They're not the same and they don't transfer similarly. Crystallinity has a, makes a difference into how, the, how well the device impregnates uh, paclitaxel into tissue. Not everybody's tissue has the same avidity for paclitaxel. There are distal embolization rates, which are quite variable. And the solubilization rates, which are a combination of multiple of the aforementioned bullet points, uh, will be different as well. So this dose time product really becomes quite problematic um, uh, quickly. And I'm going to just show the obvious here, which is that for all the pharmacokinetics we know about paclitaxel, all the known data for paclitaxel is that it follows a fairly standard 
pharmacokinetic curve, and by six months or so, or three months in tissue, it's not detectable. Uh, note that these are in nanogram uh, concentrations, which, as I mentioned before, is a billionth of a gram. Um, so we're talking about very, very, very low doses of paclitaxel in tissue. To contrast that, paclitaxel dosing in breast cancer um, is quite remarkably different and bigger. Uh, there are multiple cycles uh, totaling over a gram of paclitaxel versus um, single exposure of, uh, of a few milligrams of paclitaxel. Now, granted, these are in cremophore solution. This is in a, a, um, a, uh, a crystalline state. Nevertheless, um, the dosing is less than a percent of uh, what we use in cancer. And it turns out that this, this strategy in cancer for patients with breast cancer is so safe that it's given to women who are pregnant and there's no mortality or uh, fetal abnormalities noted in the, uh, in the babies born to those women. So the meta-analytic uh, issue number four is it's a numbers game. And all the data you've seen to date from Mahmoud, me, um, uh, Sahil, and others, um, and, and Dirk, um, will, are, are great. They're reassuring. They don't show any signal. Um, but they're too small to really show a signal or, or to demonstrate a signal. So that's why a meta-analysis is relevant and important. It actually turns out that a, a well-done prospective study would require somewhere between two and 6,000 patients to show a mortality difference in the population of patients that are studied in these trials because the, rel the rates of mortality are relatively low. They're not like the Medicare data set that Sahil showed you. They're in the single digit percentages even at five years. So we have to have a pretty big number. So let's see if um, the data actually fulfill that requirement. You see here, uh, and I think you've seen various forms of this, that if you look at the various device trials which are controlled with good follow-up, let's just focus on the PTA arm. It ranges from less than a percent in the impact SFA to over 12% in Levant 1. That's at one-year data, uh, or to, sorry, two-year data, all-cause deaths. So you can see there's quite a variability, and that's just a statistical anomaly because you're dealing with relatively small numbers. This is the curse of small numbers. Okay, what about Katsanos' uh, uh, analysis? Well, at one year and at two years, there's enough patients to make a statement about, uh, sorry, initially and at one year, there's enough patients to make a statement with robust statistics. But at three years, or two years and five years, the numbers trail off importantly because remember, we now only have 12 and three of the original 28 trials. And by the time you get to five years, the numbers are not big enough to avoid a type one error that is finding a, a relationship that does not exist. Uh, the loss to follow-up withdrawals are not completely accounted for, or they are inac inaccurately accounted for. Frankly, the math in the paper is inaccurate. When I was assigned this talk, I took the paper home with a red, with a red marker, and I had to go out and buy another red marker before I finished. Um, it's really a problem, it's, and it should never have been published in this format. It's, it's, uh, it's, an, it's a problem with the editorial process, quite honestly. I'm not going to go through all these, but trust me, when you actually do the math, this is the numbers you get. Instead of 1.7, you get 1.2. Uh, for Zilber PTX, and this is without the crossovers, you get 1.5 rather than 2.1. And for impact, and John's probably already done this, you get a much different number. And when you add them all up and you do them correctly, you actually see that the differences cross unity, uh, the confidence intervals cross unity, and you don't get a difference anymore at five years. So um, the next issue, and I think the one that probably will damn this paper the most, is that the PTA group is, is not paclitaxel, not EE, for the entirety of the analysis. Uh, the data that was presented by Mahmoud and, and Michael's uh, analysis of the programmed crossover of Zilver of about 25% in that first year is probably duplicated in all the trials that you've seen play out. You have a 25% crossover in the first year or two then those patients who are counted as paclitaxel naive in the PTA group are actually not naive. They're exposed to paclitaxel and need to move over into that arm. Well, if that's true, you're now moving over the non-death patients into the death arm. You're going to dilute the deaths. It all kind of regresses to the mean. I suspect when those data are available to us, and many of those data are being gathered and will be available in short order, uh, you're going to see that there's uh, not going to be a difference. A lot of this will blow up pretty quickly. I'm not going to go through this, but just trust me that all the, all the trials done in the U.S. had paclitaxel available to them uh, at the time of the um, trial. <coughs> so I'm just going to walk through that. So in summary, uh, paclitaxel pharmacokinetics and toxicity are well studied and characterized. There are no prior data 
that very, very low levels of drug are present, that are present as part of D DCB and DES uh, and use produce a mortality effect years later. In order to claim otherwise and therefore be describing a very novel, grave, and significant paclitaxel toxicity, one would need to present level one evidence, prospective, randomized, and appropriately sized. A non-patient level meta-analysis such as Katsanos with multiple flaws, I believe many of them fatal, does not suffice to change my mind or my practice. Based on the analysis, it's impossible for me to know whether paclitaxel uh, affects mortality. In order for at least me to understand that and think for all of us to recognize that without uh, a lot of artifact, we will need large numbers, low loss to follow up, complete accounting for all crossovers, and a more appropriate assessment of any dosing relationship that might exist. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Um, next up, we'll, and the last talk for the session before we have a panel discussion will be the uh, Dr. Babar, uh, Usman Babar, who will uh, show us interpretation of meta-analyses, uh, critical insight for a clinician. Great, thanks so much. Uh, thank you for <clears throat> the invitation, uh, PK. So my talk's a little bit different than the ones you've just heard. Um, I'm going to just try to provide some context and perspective um, and how we sort of should interpret or think about uh, meta-analyses. And some of the points I'll be making are very um, similar to what Dr. Gray just mentioned with respect to um, potential implications of the Katsanos meta-analysis for, I think, future regulatory action. So here are my disclosures. So uh, what is a meta-analysis? You know, so if you go back to 1976, Dr. Glass published this, this paper where he actually defined this for us. This was at a time when we were just starting to do meta-analytic work, and he describes three types of analyses and data. Primary analysis, where you actually answer the original question. Secondary analyses, where you repurpose your data to answer a different question. And then finally, meta-analysis, which is basically combining a bunch of different analyses and, and putting quantitative uh, synthesis behind it. Now, as we all know, in the last 30 years, uh, the, there has been an explosion, exponential growth in the number of meta-analyses being, uh, being published. And this uh, is really probably due to two factors. One is rapid dissemination of data and computational tools that allow us to rapidly um, perform these analyses. Now, uh, this growth has not been met with, uh, has certainly been met with a lot of criticism. I think the prevailing sentiment is that a lot of meta-analyses are really not helping or advancing science, but actually adding some confusion and noise. Ioannidis put this paper together in 2016, where he actually suggested that only 3% of meta-analyses are decent and useful. He suggested 20% are flawed beyond repair. And he said 27% are redundant and unnecessary. So at least based on his interpretation, uh, results from modern day meta-analyses are perhaps at best confusing and at worst, I would say, misleading. Nevertheless, uh, and, and to overcome this, there have been a lot of efforts, uh, quorum statement, the PRISMA statement, there's even a registry now. So you have to register your meta-analyses, no different than you do for uh, clinical trials at clinicaltrials.gov. And so there's been a lot of effort to try to put some rigor, some standards, um, and approaches so we, can, so we can have meaningful conversations. Nevertheless, uh, there are certainly valid reasons to perform meta-analyses have already been mentioned uh, to study very rare outcomes. Our individual trials aren't often powered to detect uh, signals in events that are clinically meaningful. And I think a good example is stent thrombosis with coronary drug-eluting stents. Um, what about certain subgroups of interest? Uh, clinical trials generally underrepresent certain populations. Uh, women continue to be underrepresented, patients with renal impairment. And sometimes we need to confirm or refute subgroup findings. So in the second generation DES um, original registration trials, there was a suggestion that perhaps these uh, devices weren't um, efficacious or safe in diabetics, and um, that sort of signal required meta-analytic -analytic work to, to confirm or, or refute that. So how do we approach meta-analyses? As was just, uh, just discussed, the top uh, bullet point is the most common way. We basically aggregate the study level data. This is the most common, it's rapid, it's cheap, it's, it's efficient, we can do this pretty, pretty quickly. Individual patient level data is tough, but it's much more powerful because you can't get access to this data, but with these data you can do at the time to event analyses, identify predictors, look at subgroup effects in a valid manner. Direct comparisons is what's most commonly done, but now we're seeing more and more indirect meta-analyses or network meta-analyses. This basically means that although a trial may have compared uh, drug A and drug B and others compared drug B to C, in your network 
approach, you can then compare drug A and C. And now we're seeing Bayesian meta-analyses also being uh, performed, which basically take into account prior assumptions or beliefs that you may or may not have, and then integrate that into posterior distributions um, for your hypothesis. So what are some things you want to think about when you look at any meta-analysis? Well, there's a lot. I've just put down a few that I think are, are meaningful and, and relevant. First is heterogeneity, and heterogeneity comes in two flavors. There's clinical heterogeneity, which is something you as the reader has to determine based on the type of patients enrolled, the methods, the follow-up. Then there's statistical heterogeneity, which is something we can quantify. Publication bias or selective reporting. Small study effects, and I think uh, as, uh, in Dr. Gray's talk, I think this is particularly relevant to the Katsanos meta analysis, the signal of most concern was that signal at five years with a hazard ratio of 1.9, and that's based on basically 105 events, which is a very small number. And then finally, how well conducted were the individual trials? How much uh, follow-up was, con uh, what was the follow-up rate, um, blinding, how well did uh, participants adhere to the protocol, and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to walk through a couple of uh, representative examples of meta-analyses that I think illustrate some of these concepts when we are trying to interpret these and figure out whether or not we should actually uh, take these um, and, and change our practice as a result. So this is Ajay Kirtani's meta-analysis in Circulation 2009, where he studied the impact of DES versus bare metal stents. This is in, in coronaries. Um, on the left, he meta-analyzed randomized control trials. You can see uniform um, estimate of non-significance with very little heterogeneity. On the right, Observational studies, over 180,000 patients where he detected almost a 25% reduction in mortality with DES. The purpose here is simply to uh, emphasize that just because you have more numbers and large uh, number of trials here in these observational studies, that does not eliminate the bias or the weakness in the, in the trials themselves. When you meta-analyze weak studies, you don't eliminate bias. If anything, you amplify the bias and you can confuse interpretation. What about this idea of inflated effects with small studies? Well, this is a, a nice paper um, where the uh, authors looked at a group of, uh, group of studies. On the x-axis is the total number of participants in the various trials. The y-axis is the deviation from the truth or the point estimates. And what you can see here in a very nice linear relationship, as the number of participants or events decreases, your signals or your treatment effects go up. This has been shown over and over. This is empiric. This is true for randomized trials. This is true for meta-analysis you are more likely to find a, a, an inflated estimate when you have small numbers or small study effects compared with larger numbers. And what about other features of your trials? There's been some, uh, some mention about the trials with the drug-coated balloons with respect to their follow-up and follow-up completion. So John Biddle uh, looked at the issue of DAP duration and all-cause mortality in this editorial. And on the left, he found when trials were stopped prematurely for, uh, for a variety of reasons, there was actually no evidence of harm with excess uh, prolonged DAP duration. But when you looked at the trials that completed their pre-planned enrollment, you actually found a signal for increased ha harm with prolonged DAP. So again, your inference and your interpretation of your meta-analysis is predicated on understanding the details of the studies with respect to their quality, the level of heterogeneity, and, um, and also the number of events and number of participants that were enrolled in the respective studies. So I want to just close with a couple of comments, and I, you know, as what's happening right now with, with, with this space and how think fast uh, things are evolving, uh, I'd like to go back to the story of rosaglitazone and just kind of propose that perhaps what we're seeing is analogous to what happened um, about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, now, there are some uh, clear differences. The issue with rosaglitazone, I think, had a lot more biological basis uh, behind it than what we're seeing with DCB and paclitaxel. Nevertheless, my purpose is simply to illustrate regulatory reactions to accumulating data. So rosiglitazone was approved by the FDA in 1999. It was approved based on relatively small studies, none of which were powered for cardiovascular endpoints, but rather to lower uh, serum glucose. We have a provocative meta-analysis in 2007, 42 studies. These were cl clinically heterogene uh, heterogeneous studies, limited follow-up, and there was a demonstration of increased risk for MI of 1.43. And here's the meta-analysis right here. So this generated immediate controversy. Lots of other papers get published. Some are in line with this. Some are not in line with this. Very similar to what we're seeing right now.
Nevertheless, the Food and Drug Administration issues a black box warning in 2007. Several years later, they restrict sales um, of this drug, and um, as, as a result, uh, um, sales of rosiglitazone certainly uh, plummeted. In 2010, the FDA also mandated that the sponsor or the uh, manufacturer of this drug conduct um, a, an independent adjudication of one single large trial that was ongoing, the record trial. So this was a trial that was designed to study cardiovascular endpoints. It was meant to be powered for this using standardized definitions and follow-ups. Um, this was, again, uh, run by the manufacturer of rosiglitazone, but then it was independently adjudicated by Duke Clinical Research Institute. This is a slide um, that I actually got from the advisory panel's meeting in 2013, and this trial showed no increased risk for MI, hazard ratio of 1.13, and based on this independent um, analysis and other uh, data that were sort of consistent with this, um, the drug restrictions in 2013 were lifted by the FDA. So this took six years, but we did see how the FDA reacted. There was concerning signal, lots of confusing data was coming out, and finally the regulatory stance uh, took actually a trial, um, to uh, not only a trial, but uh, independent analysis to change their, um, change their stance, and uh, the label now simply states that the available data on the risk of MI are inconclusive. So, in conclusion, uh, meta-analyses is an increasingly common technique that allows us to rapidly synthesize data. Um, the inferences, however, from these meta-analyses are completely dependent on the quality, heterogeneity, and I think most relevant to this conversation is the size of the study, the number of events when you're evaluating your pool estimates. And there is certainly historical precedent from a regulatory perspective to, rest to restrict sales of FDA-approved products and then uh, wait results of large, adequately powered trials before those positions are, are changed. So thank you. All right. <clears throat> that was a great session. Um, we have about five minutes uh, before the next session will start. Um, if I could have the uh, panelists or presenters uh, up to the podium, uh, just a couple questions, and maybe we can solve the whole world's problems in five minutes or less. Bill, as, as you settle in, um, can I ask you a simple question? I was always taught that the mortality rate with PAD is about 15% um, at five years or so. Are we jumping up and down for 15% to 18% for no real reason? I'm, I'm sorry, so the... The, a the average mortality on most uh, of these patients with PVD are, as, as, as Eric showed, is about 15% to 20%, just with clodicants in general. Right. And now we have a mortality rate that's about 15% from the trials. Are we jumping it up and down for something that doesn't inherently move that needle very far? Yeah, so I think, well, the answer is if there's an effect, that it's important. So we have to be respectful of that. Um, and I just don't know that data shows that effect yet um, without other confounders. But I, I think that, I think all of us have taken it very seriously. We're, our first job is to protect the patient and uh, assure safety. So whether, whether it goes from 15 to 18% or, you know, 14 to 19% is still a number that we have to reconcile. But I wanted to comment quickly on Eric's pa uh, paper. I think we have to recognize, too, that the numbers are larger probably because um, that was an inpatient sample, um, not an outpatient sample. A MedPAR data only really allows an inpatient sample, and by definition, those patients are different. And I think the mortalities uh, reflect that. I want to get back to uh, Sahel or Eric if they're the still Eric around. Eric, comment on that. Actually, Eric stepped out and Sahel had a lecture in... Uh, Oh, gotcha. In the, well, in I, I have a question, though. Is, is the idea of an intention to treat or as treated analysis, which is so germane to uh, 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 Castano's paper, um, in the ERIC uh, CMS data, do they take into account exposure over time, i.e., multiple procedures? Is that even considered in this? I actually don't know that. I don't know either. Because I would suspect it isn't. And I, I, I bet you it's a stronger argument if they have, as we already know, 50% of CLI patients are, have a mortality, but they also probably have repeat procedures. And so their exposure is probably much higher. And that may actually play into this role of mortality. Um, and then, um, Juan, uh, the FDA just released a, a, a letter just this past, a couple days ago uh, in anticipation of their panel reiterating this idea that they believe there is an association. Your, your final slide suggested, I'm not sure, there probably is. We have, to, we have to acknowledge that, but what do you think the association can be, given the, the biologic effect here? 
Look, uh, there are a lot of associations in life, all right? You know, association of rich trying to figure going out to Europe. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, the, the thing is, this is a mess. I mean, that's that's the thing. And and one of the big issues is um, that um, if you look at, uh, for example, previous examples that were presented in a drug alluring stance, we had a very clear cause of events: stent thrombosis. Right now, we don't even have a a principle. We don't even understand what we're talking about. If I ask everybody here what the problem is, I don't really think anybody can really say what the problem is. All cause mortality is not an issue. And it's very difficult to actually say that biologically speaking, paclitaxel is causing accidents and, you know, uh, pul pulmonary embolism and strokes. And so biologically speaking, one of the things is, uh, I'm not going to debate that there is a numerical difference. And that's why I put on my conclusion slide, apparently there is. But if you actually look at the biology of the mechanism of action, how paclitaxel works and how it's actually uh, clear from the body, it, it is actually very unlikely that we can actually link as a cause effect the presence of paclitaxel beyond one year with uh, all cause mortality, which is actually intriguing is, and, uh, and, and you know, Bill um, explained that in a beautiful way, is I would expect an increase in mortality at one year if we were going to talk about something here, because this is where all the biological activity of plaque actually is going to, to happen. But we don't see effects at one year, but we see effects later on. It, it doesn't really make any sense from the biological point of view. But everything in science is possible, so I'm, I'm still you know, waiting to see all the data analysis we're doing, and, uh, but I don't really think it makes any sense, personally. Yeah, and, and everybody who's led the trials, I mean, everybody who's been on the forefront of all these paclitaxel trials, we were so focused on patency as a primary endpoint, right? I mean, we wanted something that worked in an inhospitable environment. Uh, back to Bill's and, uh, and Eric's uh, and Sahail's uh, points, are we just over, are we over ex ex expressing a, uh, an effect that is small number driven? Is that not the, the, the bottom line here? And do you think that the FDA, although with this letter they put out, because they believe there's an association, do you think that will be taken into account as your panel comes up in a week? John, what do you think? Well, my personal opinion is that it's all small numbers driven. I mean, I think it's just... It's just error bars. Yeah. 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 And it's, at the end of the day, all of these reanalyses and reanalyses, you just see that there's, the N is very low for the PTA control arm of these trials. And you look at impact SFA, where you had like a 2.4% mortality at one year in the PTA arm. I mean, it's off the charts, an aberration low. And how can that not impact... Uh, Results and it clearly skews the numbers for sure. Dirk, in in Europe, what's the number, particularly in Germany, on use of DCBs since the uh, meta-analysis? Has it declined? Yeah, I think there was certainly some decline, but not to the extent you're seeing that here in the U.S. Uh, so I, I think uh, utilization is still relatively stable, probably in, at the level of maybe 80 percent of what it was before. I mean, the main reason is that. I think what's common ground between U.S. practicing physicians and European physicians is probably that we all have severe doubts in the findings of the meta-analysis. And I think it is probably a generally suggested reason that we are dealing here with a misleading um, effect of the small numbers. Uh, the difference is the basically the legal system, right? I mean, we are luckily in a little bit... Um, less strict uh, legal environment. Uh, so, um, and also, uh, quite honestly, our regulatory authorities have not issued any formal statement uh, in that regard. So it's, diff it's a different situation to what you are facing here in the US with an FDA statement, which puts certain obligations on your shoulders. And of course, also uh, yeah, the whole legal environment in, in this country. I think the numbers I saw were down, what is it, 45%? Is that right? Is that is about right? right? So um, any other final comments from the panelists? I really want to thank everybody for participating in this session uh, as we transition now to the uh, industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lawrence. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to continue right to the next uh, next session. I'd like to thank all of uh, our our, um, our um, panel uh, for doing this, and uh, I'm going to kick the session off for a few minutes, and then have Dirk take over. Um, 
So uh, this is a great opportunity. So one of the things that we were, th we were thinking about is to set up a session where there can be some interaction with industry and ask some questions uh, to, especially in light of all this. So we've, we've asked um, our, our, our esteemed panel to, to come up um, uh, from representing all the different uh, companies that are associated with uh, the, the packet taxel uh, devices. So, so we have representatives here, and I'm going to just have them introduce themselves from all the different companies. Go ahead, starting with yourself. From Philips Healthcare. Hi, my name is Kat Jennings, and I'm with Boston Scientific. Hi, my name is Mark Pesina. I'm the general manager of Medtronic's peripheral business. Uh, Logan Brummett, Cook Medical. Hi, Tim Hug from BD Bard. Well, thank you very much. And, you know, and I want to, we've told them uh, how this is going to run. So what we did was we sent a survey of questions to, the, to about 240 interventional cardiologists, radiologists, and vascular surgeons. And we got questions back uh, for, for each one of these companies. And, and, you know, we've sent them to you in full disclosure just to, because, you know, we don't want any surprises. We, but we, these are legitimate questions from people. And we've also told you that the audience may ask questions that obviously we don't know about. So it'll be a lot of fun. So, so we're, we're just going to start off, right? We'll start off. I mean, it's, it's different, and it usually doesn't happen in this manner. But I thought that it's important in this is because with all this controversy that's going on, that, that we need to have a relationship that's open and that we can ask questions and, and really find out what you guys are thinking about what's happening, you know, because a lot of times uh, the, the, all of us here work closely with you, so we, we get to speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. However, our audience and, and people in the community don't really get to interact enough to really see where you were going. So that's part of the reason. Dirk, any comment on that? Or? No, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so I I'm, I'm, I'm just want to ask a question in general to all of you first, okay? And um, I think since Paclitaxel is of concern, so if, if, if the FDA, one of the questions that we're asked is, if the FDA uh, comes out saying that uh, the, the, either a black box warning against Paclitaxel or not, is there already a, a, a thought about moving to another sort of anti restenotic drug in your portfolio? I mean, as, as, as a general industry feeling, is, is that something that you guys would do? Because as you know, in the coronaries, um, you know, Paclitaxel was initially um, a hot topic, but now Seralimus or Lima-based drugs have taken over. So the question is, in the superficial femoral artery, is, it, is that something that the companies as, as a group are, are, are looking at individually or, or in, in your research pipelines? Anyone? Sure. Go ahead. Um, sure, I'll, I'll run first. Uh, thank you, Dr. Krishnan, for inviting us, and Dr. Shine. I appreciate this opportunity. But uh, how I kind of look at it and how we've looked at it, and it's not just about the December communication or the March communication. As my father, Earl, tells me, you get busy living or get busy dying in business here, uh, you kind of get busy innovating, right? And from a business standpoint, or you fall to the wayside, right? So from an innovation standpoint, if you weren't looking at that kind of stuff already, right, to meet the needs of the patients and clinicians, to look at other drug and drug delivery devices, you probably wouldn't be setting yourself up for success. So. We believe, right, in our current data, from our efficacy standpoint, from our safety standpoint, but at the same time, you gotta be thinking two, three, five, ten 10 years down the line, which would definitely include different drugs, potentially, different devices, and what have you. And my guess is many of you would have a similar answer to that, too, so. And I'm not, by the way, gonna lay out my entire R&D no, pipeline. No, no, no. Nor do we expect you, nor do we expect you to. Either, but, uh, nor do we expect you to. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just a general question because I think, you know, a lot of the cardiologists, especially, uh, you know, I'm a cardiologist and Dirk as well, and we, we, we talk about the efficacy of Lewis drugs. And now with the BTK arena on, uh, with the uh, Lutonix already uh, getting, hopefully getting approved soon, a couple of BTK trials on the way with, with Boston, with stents and other scaffolding platform, that was the reason for the question. So does this in any way reduce, one of the other questions was with the, with the concern on paclitaxel above the knee. Uh, let's let's ask Boston Scientific uh, this question: uh, is, is is there any concern um, about about going forward with your with your below the knee trials that you have planned? And could you please tell us about the trials that are ongoing and what what's planned? Sure, no, absolutely. So maybe just another thing to add to to what Tim mentioned is, you know, I, I loved um, when when John. Uh, put up that slide about the, the mortality data when you look at all drug-eluting stents because the highest numbers we saw were actually with the Linus-based technology. Uh, I know Lindsay McCann always does a good job of reminding us that we've tried Limus before, and historically, the, the trials that we've seen just haven't worked, haven't panned out. 
Uh, now, we are fortunate at Boston. We have our, our sister division that does really well with, uh, with LIMAS-based technologies. So obviously, we're always looking to innovate and bring you know, the next generation solutions. But I do want to pause and talk a bit about our BTK portfolio. Uh, so we are in the process of a clinical trial called Saval, which is looking at our self-expanding stent for below the knee that is, uh, has a polymer and is coated similar to the way that our Alluvia stent is. And we're really bullish on that. We view this as a space that has a tremendous unmet clinical need. And when we think about uh, the problems that exist for CLI patients, we think that more new technology is really needed in the space. Well, thank you. How about Spectronetics? Are there any second thoughts with the controversy going on above the knee? I know you're ready to launch uh, the BTK program. Yeah, absolutely. No second thoughts. We are moving forward. Uh, we have patients enrolling as we speak mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S. as well as a number of patients in Europe. So we are still very bullish on the opportunity below the knee and the importance of paclitaxel even below the knee. And this one is specifically to, to Bard. The question was very specific, is, is are you expecting, or I should say, uh, Tim Hogg, uh, is, there, is, there, is there any, any are, there, are there specifically any, any hurdles that you expect for the approval of the Lutonix uh, uh, BTK device? Yeah, we've, uh, we've, we've publicly said that we filed our final module, right? And we are having that conversation as of right now with the FDA. I think that it would be naive to think that obviously this hovering over and the updating panel 19th and 20th probably comes into mind for some of the reviewers. With that being said, the conversations are ongoing and we're cautiously optimistic that we can bring what we believe this is game-changing product to what you had mentioned in an area that has so many unmet needs. So, so as of right now, it's status quo and, and we are cautiously optimistic about the future on that. So we'll hear shortly. Fantastic. This question is for Logan Brummett from Cook. This is from Interventional Radiologist. The, the, the question is, Cook's portfolio below the knee uh, is limited. Uh, you know, it, it, with the drug-coded advances that are being made below the knee and, and different types of devices, atherectomy devices, is, 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 is Cook thinking about a, a drug-coded stent below the knee? Are, are you, uh, what is your, your, your BTK uh, future, future? I guess the, the easy answer is yes. I think just like everybody, that we all feel there's an unmet need below the knee. And I think for us, it's what can we do to provide that? For us, you know, the question comes back is what drug's right? So for me, whenever I get that question, because there's a perception like it has to be PTX because that's what we use in the SFA. I, I always come back to the to the clinician and say, well, what, what do you need? So for us, it's it's looking at all the research that we have, which is quite a bit. As Tim said, we're not going to share the pipeline, but we're absolutely looking below the knee. We know there's an unmet need there. We know there's a lot to be done. You know, we've we've put a lot of eggs in in the SFA, but that doesn't mean we're not going full steam ahead below the knee. This uh, question is for Mark Pacino, but really for all of you. Um, with the concerns of of the trial, is there any uh, changes that, as companies, you are the ones who lead innovation, and we as clinicians <clears throat> appreciate it deeply. But however, with the concerns brought up through this meta analysis. Uh, is there going to be any changes in how all of you conduct trials in the future? So is there like a two to one randomization difference? Are you going to change endpoints? Uh, and it can be one by one. Mark, you take it first. Sure, I'll take it first. I actually think the previous panel did a great job of teeing up this conversation because I think it is a law of small numbers. So one of the things that we've come out publicly uh, over the last couple months is we've gone back and opened up all the laws to follow up in our clinical trials we've been able to find 97% of the patients out to five years. And so, by the way, when you find the extra patients, you start to see the signal decrease and attenuate. As you add in other trials, other randomized trials, like our Japan RCT, you also see the signal start to uh, attenuate. And so, as you think about this, and you think about adding more and more uh, information, more and more power from more and more studies with more and more control arms, I think that's incredibly insightful and helpful. I also think the big data sets that you know Sahil has presented on, Eric is going to present it on, et cetera, are critically important to that story. You know, as we think about clinical trials, though, going forward, we absolutely have already learned some lessons, right? The importance, I think, of all of us of standardizing um, all of the ways that we categorize events, standardizing the way that we're going to follow these patients, whether it's lost of follow-up or withdrawn from consent in terms of finding their vital status over time, right? And there's a number of other things that, that as we go forward, I think we, we have an obligation to do a better job in our clinical trials. Great. One, another question here, this is from a vascular medicine doctor in Cornell. The question, the question is very clear. How are the companies communicating with the patients who've already received the drug-coded technology, 
you know, from one of your devices. Um, is it a direct communication? Is it through media? Or is it, is it the, the duty of the physician to communicate with each individual patient? Any one of you can take it. I can go. Well, you want me? I, I'm happy to start. So I think, I think all of us, I think, have um, left it up to the discretion of the physicians at this point. Our job has been to inform the physicians of all the latest clinical effort. That's why we went out there so quickly and tried to get the Jack article published to really talk about the safety profile of the devices. I think every company did something similar or a customer letter to make sure that every, that every physician and administrator was up to speed and, and aware of the situation. And you know, clearly there'll be more activity over the coming weeks with the panel ahead. Logan? Uh, and I think you know, from a Cook perspective for us, you know, as you said, you know, it's up to the clinician, but one thing that we've done is we've put, we've put all of our data on our website. So you're more than happy to go to Cook Medical, anybody can, and get access to every bit of the data that we have. We've scrubbed it ground, uh, scrubbed it down so you can you know, say dehumanize it basically just to an extent. But if anybody wants to gain, gain access to our data, we've we've made it public. You have to fill out a form to to gain it, uh, but we've we've provided that out for anybody to get. Yeah, I think our approach has been, you know, at the end of the day, the last person that probably one of your that you want your patients to hear from is me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with that being said, uh, I think it's important, to, as you guys alluded to, is, is to provide you guys the data, the unvarnished data, right, for all of our clinical trials, provide our data, and then obviously there'll be more coming, as uh, Mark alluded to here, over the next couple of days and weeks here. So. And we, from the very beginning, and back even in January, communicated that we would share our data with anyone and everyone. Um, all the different societies that came to us, we said our data is available. We've analyzed it, happy for you to analyze it as well. So we've been very open. And when it comes to patients, it's absolutely been through the physicians, through customer letters. I think every one of us sent a customer letter after the FDA statement in, in March. Mm -hmm. Make sure that all of our customers and physicians were aware of the situation and where we currently see our own technologies. We have a question from uh, the audience, Pete, uh, Dr. Ferugia. So just, uh, just a follow up uh, with this. You know, one of the things that I think a lot of people turned to try and start doing was consider obtaining informed consent from patients who were being treated um, before they went into the lab for a possible DCB usage. I've actually been an advocate that I don't believe informed consent in this specific area is really possible because as physicians, we're not necessarily fully grasping whether this is going on or not, and trying to get a, a, a patient who is, you know, potentially uh, losing a limb or just coming in who's already scared and doesn't really understand everything that's gonna be going on in them, um, to also give consent in an informed manner to the potential that something is there or not there. So I'm interested to see what, what you guys think um, from a company standpoint. Do you think it's possible to, to get a patient to understand everything that we're talking about right now? Because that really changes whether or not you believe that we should be using this right now until the FDA comes out with their statement? That's a, that's a tough question. <laughs> that's a really I mean, tough I, question. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll hang myself on this one, but <laughs> I'll, I'll be candid. I mean, if they can't understand it from you, who's the physician, who they trust, right, implicitly, who they've come to you to treat them, how, as he said, the last person they want to hear from is, is the sales company. So I, that makes it very difficult, I would think, for any of us in industry to, to try to do that. And I would say from, again, from a physician standpoint where we've seen the challenges, it's been the areas where risk management, the litigiousness of it has made it difficult for you. I mean, let's not, I'm sure, let's be honest, there are people that still use paclitaxel devices throughout the country, right? We follow up with the FDA and what we believe what they've said and that's the stance that we've, that we've held to at Cook and we're not pushing it out there. But again, it's to the discretion of the physician, and I don't think it's up to us to be able to do that because, again, I, they trust you. I don't. We're we're just we're the device company, right? I, I'm not yeah. Right. Yeah. It's. A, I, I, I think it's. I look at it this way. We just uh, had what I believe is probably eight or nine uh, of the most international thought leaders, key opinion leaders, get up and walk through some of the challenges and issues actually with the data. And I'm sure some of us walked out, walked, are watching this saying, wow. And some of us are watching this saying, wow, I'm now even more confused, right? So I think there's still a question of, as of right now, whether or not there is, 
what the possible what what could possibly be, be the association, and, and to have that be conveyed, I think would be very very difficult. I want to say you know with certainty here though we stand. Uh, our company does behind our product relative to a, an efficacy and safety standpoint, whether it be Levant 1, Levant 2, right, the ISR, the BTK, the AV data, no statistical difference at any endpoint. But, I, I, you know, the FDA and, and obviously our own analysis, there's that increased numerical number that, that raises some questions. And until we figure that out, it's even more difficult for you. It's difficult for us to look at. So Great, great points. One last question. I think we have to end uh, because of time. And, and I think this is going to be a very sensitive question for the physicians. So this was asked uh, by a vascular surgeon in one of the conferences to a, a panel of us, and I think it was a very interesting question, so I thought I should ask you. So is, is, is there an inherent conflict to make national PIs of your trials who are consultants with your companies? And should there be an independent uh, person who is leading the trial who is not affiliated with the, with the companies, and in your minds, do you think this would make a difference in the validity of data? And let me tell you the context in which the question was asked. The, the context in which was the question was asked was obviously uh, you know, a couple of the things that happened with uh, the Cook data as well as the other data, even though we know that the national PR probably had nothing to do with that. So that was the question, because it, 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 the, the um, undertone was that whether you are a reliable if you're conflicted as the national PI. So that's my question. And I, it's a tough question. If you choose not to answer, I'm fine with it. But that was emailed to me by the same yeah. surgeon. I, I can oh, want to go? Go ahead. No, yeah? No, go ahead, All please. Right, I, well, we can both answer it. Yes. Um, listen, I think it's a really good question. And I think it's a fair question. It's a question that it has to be asked, especially when you have a situation like, like we've had. I think um, there's a couple really important pieces. One is that um, the partnership that we have with our PIs is, is absolutely critical. Right to execute the studies, to give input into the data, to to really spend that time, and so inherently, even though there is that relationship, you are going to have some bias in terms of just the closeness that your partnership is, whether there's a monetary piece or not. I think that's one thing. The second thing is you. All of our clinical trials have belts and suspenders. We have independent clinical events committees. We have DSMBs that are really are are really designed to address that that specific issue. And then I think the last part is, I don't think any of us as industry companies would be around if we didn't take the, the patient, the, the clinical quality, um, absolutely seriously when we go through this, because this is not just a one trial type of thing for a company like Medtronic or any of the other groups up here. This is a, a long-term investment that we make in the, um, in the reputational uh, piece of our businesses. And that really you know, starts and ends with the clinical practice. And as a follow-up, oh, go ahead, good. Well, I was just going to add just one quick comment. By the way, I agree with everything that Merck just said. Um, but one of the things as part of, as you may know, for the FDA panel is that we needed to work together as across industry. And so we've had to sit down and look at each other's data and question each other, push each other, and looking at what is this really telling us. And we needed to have someone come and speak on behalf of all of industry at the panel. Uh, and we chose Dan Clare because he happens to not be connected with any of us, mm. right? And so we did a very proactively said who could speak and not have that. And so now he has seen all of our data and will be speaking on behalf of it. Fantastic. Well, I think that answered that question. So because that was going to be who was going to speak on behalf of you at the FTA. So again, Dirk, any, any comments or any questions um, from the audience? I think uh, this session has been phenomenal. I really appreciate the candor and honesty of all of you. I appreciate the time that you took. Dirk and I, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.